<laughs> well, this doesn't really have anything to do with food, but I was wondering about like fireplaces and stuff like that. If you're burning logs and, and paper, uh -huh. if that gives off like a lot of toxic. It does. It gives off a lot of carbon monoxide, depending upon what you know you're burning. Yeah. If you're burning citrus, you know, those heavy oils, and there's a lot more tars as well as the carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. So you have to, your chimney and area should be have a glass in front of it and have good circulation so the smoke and gas doesn't come into the house. And most of the logs or the firewood that they sell, is it treated? A lot of them are treated. <laughs> what are they treated with? Um, they treat it, they treat it with substances dried out, uh, some kind of solvent. And they don't necessarily have to say that. Like they don't obviously it's not green. No, you're not eating it. So. Yeah. No restrictions on it. Right. Oh, uh, yeah, I just have a question about honey and infants. Because I, I work at Child Development Center and they talk about uh -huh. not feeding honey to infants when they're one year old. So I guess I want to hear your opinion. <clears throat> Well, there are several reasons that they don't like to feed honey to infants. Uh, most honey is heated to high temperatures, so the insulin that the bee, when the bee collects the nectar, swallows it, and he manufactures an insulin-like substance that converts the nectar into honey. Then he gets back, they, she gets back to the hive, they vomit it. So honey is bee puke. Basically, is what it is, but it has an insulin-like substance which converts 90% of the carbohydrate in it into enzymes for digesting, utilizing, and assimilating proteins, and only 10% sugar. Once you heat it up to 100 degrees, between 93 and 100 degrees, you alter and destroy that insulin-like substance, so then it's back into sugar. It's not a radical sugar until you take it over 104 degrees. And most honeys are heated a minimum of 118 degrees. So if an infant has that, they'll have a sugar problem. It could cause anaphylaxis. Also, they worry about bacteria in honey, which is the most absurd thing, because bacteria cannot thrive in honey. Causing it to ferment, but still alcohol destroys bacteria too. So it's not easy to get honey. In fact, they say that these the people who've done the testings, experiments, have said that it's absolutely impossible to get the honey to thrive and even live, sustain itself in honey. So it's the anaphylactic <coughs> children, infants will have from the high sugar of heated honeys, but it doesn't happen with unheated honey. Okay. Unheated below 93 degrees. Would you say it's only 10% sugar and raw honey? Mm -hmm. Unheated honey, unheated. yeah. Only 10% will be used as sugar. And what's the other 90%? Enzymes enzyme? for digesting, utilizing, and assimilating proteins. Huh. Question. Uh, first exposure, just uh, an absorber today. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You, sir. Do you have a question? Sure. Um, about the juice, I mean, do you, do you generally give everybody the same, you know, parsley, um, a, a celery, summer squash? Yeah, and so there's like three or whatever juices, and that's pretty much it, as I understand it. Why not? There's a zillion vegetables out there. Why just those? Uh, because the others are more herbal and they're stronger and they will have greater reactions. Um, for instance, let's say um, with Kimberly, I used um, a little bit of um, cauliflower and broccoli. Now, if you use too much of that, it'll make the thyroid slow, slower. Um, and that can cause lethargy, tiredness, and some people need that just to slow them down. So I use others in small amounts. And you can use any one you want. You just know what it's for and no more than 5% of your juice. So is there a way to find out what they're for? 
There are lots of herbal books around that have that in it. Along the same line, what about adding kale and other green? Like I said, no more than 5% because they're very concentrated. If you're having that four times a day, you can be causing yourself to go in quite a radical direction. I like the celery because um, it does it is an extreme and it keeps the salt level so it's like a constant IV sodium level in the body. It helps stimulate the adrenals and everybody needs, you know, some adrenaline to keep active. And a lot of people who've been eating cooked foods for so long have had lots of salt storages in their body and the high celery content helps detoxify that. The uh, parsley I use because of the high vitamin um, D in it, vitamin E, and the high chlorophyll content which helps people utilize oxygen better. And it's very good at alkalinizing the blood that becomes so acidic when you detox constantly. Isn't the parsley high in zinc as well? Uh, it depends upon where it's grown. The thing that's highest in zinc is zucchini, mm -hmm. no matter what soil it's grown. Mm. That's why I use the zucchini to help pull out toxic metals. Mm -hmm. All the summer squash help do that. They've got a starch um, in them that has a tendency to attract metals. Are there different other metals for different starches? Or different no, actually all of your, your uh, summer squashes will attract any of them. So will the winter squashes, but then you get a sugar high from all the high carbohydrate content. And that's not good. Is there ever a time when you need the winter uh, squashes are good at all? She asked if there was any time that the winter squashes would be good to eat. Yes, you can have it, you know, up to 10% of your juice like you would carrot juice, just to increase the vitamin A content. I'm just wondering if there are other things on the diet that are designed to attract metals as well. Uh, cilantro is good for that. <clears throat> no more than 10% of the juice. But cilantro can do it very radically. And if you've got a lot of mercury coming out of your system or lead, you might get very fatigued, very poisoned, very nasty. The mate won't like you very much. <laughs> you, know, you can't handle it. And if you're using the, um, a, a metal extractor like that, it's always good to have either some raw cow's cream or some coconut cream with it so that as soon as the metals come into the blood, you'll have fat there to arrest it. Huh. People who drink the juice and have heart palpitations afterwards or speedy heart, that's a sign that the metals have gotten into your blood and you don't have the available blood fats to bind with it. So the heart palpitations, don't let it frighten you, you just need to sit down. But if you're going to do that, then the first juice, if, you're, if you have that effect, the side effect, then every juice in the morning should have some cream in it so that that doesn't happen. Can you use butter just after it instead of the cream? You can use, uh, instead of two tablespoons of cream or more, you can use one tablespoon of butter. And would avocado be in favor of that? Avocado won't work for that. Okay. Coconut cream, raw cream, and butter. No cheese. Pardon? Cheese. You don't want to have cheese unless, well, you can have cheese. If you get nauseous, it's a sign you should have cheese. But cheese doesn't digest well because it's very acid. And then uh, if you have it mixed it with the alkaline juice, if you have the alkaline and the acid together, neither will digest properly. So you're not going to digest as much juice if you have cheese with it. However, some people are so poisoned and get nauseous right away that they have to have cheese with their juice, but normally no. What does the avocado do? What are the properties it works with of the fat? Uh, well, that's a different question. Off of the juice, juice yeah. I'm going to save that one okay. for that yeah. particular subject. I have another juice question. I guess. Uh -huh. uh, choosing between, I rarely have time to make juice, so I buy either the substantial green, the juice evolution. So I'm wondering that, or just going like the Jama juice, and they'll make celery and parsley. They won't make squash. They'll make cucumber. Yeah, well, cucumbers and squash, summer squash. Oh, okay. 
So would that be preferable over buying the Juice Evolution if I can have fresh made? Uh, it's not organic either. Um, yeah, it's better than having nothing because that's the only place we get our vitamin, enzymes, and mineral supplement it's from the juice. Yeah, but I'm saying to choose between the, the Juice Evolution or the one that they would make. Like I would have group. both. Yeah, the juice is really great when I make it. It's noticeably superior. Incredible, yes. Yeah. Rich and alive. Yeah. If you make it every once every three days, it's not that difficult. I, I try. I just literally don't. Then get a high school kid to come over and do it. Hey, hey, I'm looking Yeah, it's so easy. Just put up on the bulletin board, you know. Every three days, you know, I'll pay you, you know, 20 bucks. <laughs> Is there a particular juicery that you recommend? The Green Life, the Green Star, or the Green Power. Yes? Where? Where? Well, directly from TriBest because they just had the, the show up in Anaheim. Uh -huh. So to the end of this month, they're running them. Wholesale is about 340 Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Can you arrange them for us? I, I have a, I'm a distributor. <laughs> You are a distributor? Yeah. Well, give me your name and number because I send people to, you know, Ferns and, and another place now that's even cheaper on, in La Cienega and Beverly Hills. Get cheap, yeah. That's yeah. I don't do They're a lot 380 of 380-something. What about Norwalk? Where's the Norwalk? Right there. Well, Norwalks have two processes, and they're a lot, a lot, you know, twenty six hundred bucks, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And they tritrate, means they masticate, break it down, then you have to press it, so it ox it touches oxygen twice, so the juice isn't as good and doesn't last as long. Yeah. In the um, in the green light, green power, and green star, it's all pressed. It's crushed and pressed rather than tritrated and pressed. So there's not a lot of oxygen that destroys it. What's the use of the magnet here? Well, the magnet helps. What it does is it frees up some of the minerals that's in the pulp, and it goes with the juice rather than staying in the pulp. I had also heard documents that it reduces the surface tension in the juice, so it's more permeable. In the cells, I don't that's, know if that's, uh, that's the same thing I was saying, but you said it a different way. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. We recommend an eight four eggs a day. Uh, that's I'm all. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky to get one easy. down without wanting to gag. <laughs> My stomach does a good. You should vomit. Well, what's the point of eating it then if I just going to chuck it up? Again? Because, so, you know, you've seen those old labels. Remember when we were kids, you said, if you, if you swallow this poison, swallow an egg and induce vomiting? Because eggs are great to pull poisons to the stomach, like milk is, but eggs is pretty profound in doing it. And it will cause you to vomit, but once you vomit it, you've gotten rid of it, and then you can keep down the eggs. But you've got to let yourself vomit if, you, if it's trying to. So but usually you only vomit like once and then you'll be able to eat for days. <laughs> eat a lot of eggs. Yeah. But vomiting is the quickest way to get rid of poisons. You don't have to worry about diarrhea, you don't have to worry about loss of fluids, discharging the bile and the poisons easily. So what kind of <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> I couldn't understand it. Saves you a trip to the toilet. <laughs> yes. It also saves a lot of nutrients lost trying to keep it from destroying intestinal tissue as it passes out. I have got a new client who was a paraplegic at 18 months old. He received some vaccines and um, the thimerosal, which is mercury, poisoned the system so he, he's like this now in a chair and he's 18 years old so he's been that way since 18 months so I've had him on a diet for about six weeks he's put on uh, 12 pounds for the first time in six years he put on weight and for the first time since he was 18 months old his feet that were bound like that relaxed 
this kid, you know, was going to vomit. And I knew that because he, if he, is, he got the mercury, went right to his nervous system like that, and caused that kind of deformity. Um, then it's it's close to the surface that he would be likely to vomit. So I had to worry. I had to warn the parents that he's going to probably vomit <clears throat> profusely for an evening and then he'll be able to eat for three days without vomiting anything and then he may go into it again and like clockwork that's the way it went first time he vomited all evening and the next day he had the biggest appetite he ate three pounds of meat the next day and the next day and the next day for ten days he ate three pounds of meat a day and about ten eggs <coughs> lots of milk this is a skinny kid that's only about He's about 5'8 and 110 pounds, <clears throat> pretty thin. So eating all that food is very happy. So in just a matter of six weeks, he's improved probably by about 5-7%. And he hasn't improved anything since he was 18 months old. So the father and mother are pretty impressed. The foods are incredible. Yes. What, what if all you eat is beef and that's the only meat that you eat? Well, you're likely to get too acidic after a while and maybe get a little irritable, maybe get depressed. Mm -hmm. So the way to balance that is eat fish with it. Eat more chicken and fish. I have a hard time eating the fish. Uh, so. Marinate it in lemon or lime. Let it sit for a couple of days in lemon or lime juice. And it'll just soften just like it's cooked. It won't be cooked in that way. It'll, you know, just like your hydrochloric acid dissolves the substances so that you can you know, separate it, fractionate it, and use the parts. Well, the lemon juice does that for you ahead of time. It's easier to eat and it's much more palatable. How about the initial drink uh, half a cup of cabbage juice, two cabbages in the morning for the information in my shoulder after the operation? And uh, I've been doing that since I saw it. That's almost two months. I don't really know the information is really. I'm still doing it. I don't know if I should keep doing it or what do you think? Is your shoulder better? And still. Uh, then I would up it to a cup instead of a half a cup. And there's no time limit, just do this. And you do it until it heals. Did you have surgery on that? Yeah. Okay, it's likely they put mercurochrome, which is mercury or methylate, or some kind of iodine. You know, they rub it on there as an antiseptic. And what that does is poison the tissue, so until that is removed, proper healing may not take place without adhesions for up to five years. You can get it for five years? No, I'm saying that if you don't do something properly, it could last that long, or even longer. Some people could stay in there for a lifetime if they're not eating the proper foods. But let's say, um, the, re the reason that I tell people to have um, green cabbage juice is because of the high vitamin K and vitamin U. It allows proper blood clotting so that a, an area can heal properly. But if you've got mercury or iodine in that area preventing uh, new cells from regenerating and, and aiding the area for healing, then you're not, the, the cabbage juice is going to help to an extent, but it's not going to change the tissue structure, Main, mainly the tendons and the bone and the cartilage are affected more by chicken, by fowl, rather than red meat. Red meat helps the, the muscles, the dark glands, and the blood enriches those. But when you're talking about connective tissue, like in the shoulder, where you had your surgery, it's much better healed by a combination of fowl and, and fish about 10 to 20 percent fish and the rest foul. So if you want to heal that quicker, just don't eat the beef because that won't repair it quickly. It'll be very slow. All the meats will, hit, will help regenerate tissue in any area. But I found in my lab experiments with animals that if the tissue were um, intestinal, neurological, 
bone, cartilage, connective tissue, tendons, um, glands that are white, and all neurological tissue um, are, are healed quicker by the ingestion of fowl, any white meats, um, with some fish as the white meat, mm -hmm. but mainly fowl. Rabbits, but we can't get them unless they've been fed awful pellets. Okay, do you have a question? No. No question? Kimberly. Not yet. Okay, do you have a question? What is your name? My name's Mike. Mike, hi Mike. Who killed the cow? Um, well, it depends, uh, you know, who's, who's, whose meat it is and who's butchering. Right. When I can, I do. Then how do you do it? Well, what I did on Pangaea last year, I butchered a goat. So what I did was made a harness for him and spun him from the tree until he went to sleep. And then I slid his juggler vein and caught the blood and put it in equal part milk and, and, and blood. Goat's milk and blood. And that tasted like milkshake, believe it or not. We had five vegetarians there, and 15 of us were, you know, um, raw animal meat eaters. And the five vegetarians were so, you know, taken by the ceremony that we had, because we had drummers, and, and we had two spinners to spin the animal from the, around, the, you know, on, in the harness, hanging from the tree. And then I did a kind of a hypnotic thing with the animal so he'd go to sleep faster. And uh, they were very impressed by that, you know, so we put, had two gallon jars full, equal parts of blood and, um, and goat's milk, and passed it around for everybody to have a little bit. So there were all these vegetarians going, <laughs> you know, they just wanted to be part of it, but they were just hips about it. And, and at once, they, every one of them, all of us, even I was a little reluctant. <laughs> and it tasted like ice cream. It didn't have any relationship to what blood tastes like by itself. And it was just like ice cream. It was so rich. And you, with all these vegetarians, you just going, gulp, 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 <laughs> like this. And that, all of the, those two gallons of milk and blood were gone in 15 minutes. And we only had 20, 19 people. 20 minutes, all of the two gallons of milk blood were gone. It's amazing, it's wonderful. But you know, everything gets killed if that, if that was your, you know, yeah, my second idea. How, everything is killed, you kill vegetables, you kill anything you eat. Right, but how, now how, if somebody wants to be a, a strict vegetarian, can they still benefit from your diet? Well, my diet isn't a vegetarian diet, but if somebody wants to eat a lot of, you know, fats, you know, then they will definitely be helped. Yes. Yeah. And then include, including the, uh, the, the dairy and the, uh, and the eggs. Oh, yeah. You won't regenerate. The people who don't eat the meat don't regenerate and heal as quickly. Okay. The problem I find with vegetarians, um, especially long-time vegetarians, is that they don't reproduce cells because they don't get enough protein. So what happens is they hold on to dead cells. So they just go through life holding on to dead cells and not getting more alive. So how about the Asian and uh, Indian populations that have been predominantly vegetarian? For the same thing for them. For generations? Yeah, same thing for them. I've seen it time after time. They're more acclimated to it. The tribes like uh, the Fulani and the Samburu mainly live on raw milk. I mean, 90% for the Fulani is raw milk. 90% of their diet is raw milk. But because they've been on it for centuries, you know, it's it's fine for them. They do have some skin, uh, skin discoloration that I find predominant in people who eat, from, you know, mainly raw milk. Right. But there's no ill health associated with it. Yes. I'm gagging on hamburger. I was doing really well eating hamburger for a while. In the last week or two, I had to like gag it down. And so I tried to go to a different kind of meat. Do you have any suggestions for helping? How 
what were you trying to eat? I was eating it with butter and honey. Butter and honey? Melted butter and honey in it, so it's like that nice uh, taste. Uh-huh. Um, that may detoxify the liver or gall, spleen or gallbladder too quickly, and that may cause some nausea because when you put that combination like that and the meat's almost in a pate, it's absorbed very readily and it can cause an instant detox. So when the body can't detox, like I said, it'll dump into the stomach first, and that's, there's your nausea. So if you eat some cheese with it, it'll probably prevent that. Okay. But you might want to eat some cheese first. Okay. So it's already in your stomach and ready to absorb the toxins. Okay. So you don't feel repulsed or don't have to experience the nausea. And also tomatoes help, you know, relax the, the uh, that kind of a detoxification. So you might make a sauce with butter and tomato. So I can what would a sauce with butter and tomato how would you do that? Just Butter and tomatoes? Room temperature, you know, butter, room temperature tomatoes, they'll blend very well. In a blender? You can even cheese, yeah, in the, yeah, in the blender, one of those little jars. Uh-huh. Add a little, you know, um, onion, the red onion, whatever you like to spice it up. Also, having the honey with it may cause too much detoxification if you're having it too often. Okay. So you might want to cut back on the honey with your beef meal for a while or just skip it sometimes. Um, what kind of a ratio would you suggest? Well, you said a few cherry tomatoes with uh, three tablespoons of honey, I mean three tablespoons of butter. So it doesn't you, matter how many tomatoes you eat as long as you still can, you know, you have room for your meat. You can have as many as you like as long as it doesn't spoil your appetite. In fact, usually, let's say you had a handful of cherry tomatoes with uh, a half a pound of meat, it's easier to eat a half a pound of meat with a handful of cherry tomatoes than it is to get the meat down by itself. Okay. But it isn't, the, the body isn't repulsed. Um, because of the uh, because of the meat itself, um, and every time that I found the repulsion, when we took a sample of the stomach fluids, we always found some kind of uh, poison that was dumping into the stomach, and that was causing the nausea. And it was the ready available proteins from the raw milk that allowed those particular glands like the liver, gallbladder, and spleen, which are all right there, dumped in, dumping into the stomach. Predominantly it was bile, um, toxic old bile that was created with heavy salts. None of them were ever evenly, um, it was never, none of those fluids were ever evenly mixed. There was always some concentration of a toxin along with the bile, even if it were just salt, heavy salt deposits. Mario, you have a question. Yeah, just a little bit more on what I mentioned before about uh, gaining weight. Right now I'm eating about uh, a container and a half of red meat and then at least one pepper. Mm-hmm. And on the loose jaws, and I was having a flight today, but how can I add to that to gain, you know, how I should gain the weight? You have to have lots of fat with your with your meat if you want to gain weight. Otherwise, you're just going to burn it. Yeah, Let me give you an example. Um, I have a fellow on the diet. He's been on the diet for about two years, maybe a little over two years. And he decided, you know, he's, he's doing well on the diet now. He was very thin before. He was gaining, gained about, uh, I guess, 40 pounds. He's about 6'2". Six 6'2". Two. Six two. And... Um, he just decided he was ready to move to the next level. So he said, I'd like to work out. I'd like to body build. Is there something, something I can do? And I said, well, have a lubrication formula every time you eat meat or an equal amount of butter and some kind of sauce. So at least, uh, you know, a half a cup to three quarters of a cup of butter with each meat meal. This is a big guy. In two and a half months, he put six inches on his chest and four inches on his arms. And everybody accused him of using steroids. Mm-hmm. So you just have to add a lot of fat. It has to be a lot of fat if so you I want to build. Have, I could have more loose jobs. I mean, loose jobs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you need. <laughs> <laughs> 
I like, I like the root formula. You can have as many as you like. Just every time you eat meat, have one. Okay. And then you put on more weight. How long? How many pounds did you put on? You put on what about seven, ten? Yeah, about seven. Yeah, that's good. Is it okay to have the lips starting like this whenever you feel hungry too? No. Meat well, it's it's good to have it once a day by itself if you want it, but it's always good to have more protein. You know, if you're going to have lots of loop formulas, you need lots of protein. Is that the detox? This is like anything. If you're over, if you have more um, carbohydrate or fats than you do protein, you're going to become protein deficient. Mm. If you have too many carbohydrates, you're going to demineralize yourself. You have tooth problems, bone problems, all kinds of, and just neurological pain. Everything will increase that is painful will be exaggerated, increased. Um, and if you eat lots of fat, it's just that, I mean, you'll feel better and all that, but you're not going to put on massive muscle. You're not going to put on muscle mass. You'll put on fat mass, which is good because it will protect you and it binds. All people who are fat, completely opposite from the medical profession, all people who are fat are healthier than people who are thin. Because people who are fat have storages of fat that bind with the poisons that are in their systems. People who are thin, those poisons get into the tissue and damage the tissue. Mm -hmm. And I used to think just the opposite, especially when I was a vegetarian. Anybody who was fat was unhealthier than anybody who was bone thin. And then when I started doing laboratory experiments and tests, I found out that the tissue in people who were thin was highly contaminated. They would injure easier, they were unhappier, they were more irritable, there were all kinds of side effects. Whereas a person who was fat usually had very few problems because they had the fat down with the toxins. Fat and happy came out. Fat and happy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I started getting fat as soon as I realized that. <laughs> of course, I can't get very fat. But so you had too much meat in relationship to the juices. You might get too acidic. Is that why the juices? Yes. You have to have, well, let's, you know, I've, I've been on this diet for 20 years almost. You know, eating meat on a daily basis. I can go more, no more than, let's say, four days without juice, and I start breaking out, as you see. I've gone four days without juice. I'm starting to break out instantly on the fourth day. But that's because I had a vagotomy, which means severed all the vagus nerve to my stomach, so acid still refluxes into my mouth. Mm -hmm. But for me, I still have to have juice, you know, frequently. And most people, especially starting the diet, are going to be highly acidic because when they detox, the poisons get into the blood and, of course, they get into the tissues. If you have the vegetable juice there, it'll alkalinize that. It'll have lots of alkalinizing minerals to bind with those poisons, and then the end result will still be alkalinity instead of acidity. Okay. Do you have a question? I do. Carol. Can you talk about, I remember a while ago you talked about the minerals from vegetables. Wait a minute, who, who did this dance, this rain dance? <laughs> no. I wanted the sun. La Jolla. <laughs> the minerals? Yeah, can you just talk about minerals and like, you know, like from the vegetable juice, I think you said those minerals aren't going to go into the tissue or something. Or, they'll do what? They, I think you said they'll take out bad minerals or something. I don't know, I think it's just talk about minerals. How long the dissertation do you want? <laughs> <laughs> you like For seven it? hours. <laughs> and how it's related to the vegetable juice and also uh -huh. like the meat or in cheese. I know you said cheese and high in minerals. Okay. How do those interact in the body? When, when minerals from vegetable juice can be utilized in any cell for any purpose because it's bioactive. Minerals from cheese cannot be utilized that way because once it's dried and cultured, it is a good detoxifier. It absorbs, but it really can't be absorbed into the cells easily because it's no longer uh, bioactively um, electrolyte bound. Right. And electrolytes have to be present, ions have to be present within the nutrients. Um, in order for the cell to absorb it. Each cell has one or two ions in it, and that's its guts. 
when it needs to eat it will attract a mineral as it passes in the blood serum and so it opens and the one or two ions inside will attract the ions that are bound with that mineral and the mineral attached to a food nutrient whether it's protein H2O like sodium usually carries H2O potassium may call, carry glycogen whether the glycogen is made from pyruvate or carbohydrate um, just different minerals will carry different nutrients with it so when the cell wants to eat that it opens up and attracts it if the ions aren't active there's no magnetic force so it can't be utilized and absorbed properly um, if you concentrate like so like salt in the blood let's say you have three little bitty grains of salt you will uh, in a body about five eight about 140 pounds the you will increase the concentration of sodium molecules in the blood to where they clump in about four to five in a clump. So what happens when the cell opens to eat H2O, it'll try to pull that sodium cluster into itself and it can't do it. What happens is the magnetism is so great outside that it pulls the ions, which means it pulls the guts out of the cell. And the cells can never eat anything again, so it shrivels like a raisin and dies. Right. And one little bitty, bitty grain of salt will destroy one million red blood cells that way from clumping, clustering. You know that you won't even see it's about the pin of you know the head of a pin, but still you have a lot of it. And, you know, over and over, you know, 50, 60 years. That's a lot of destroyed red blood cells. Is there any feedback as to whether it kills the cells that are supposed, basically supposed to die or that are weak? Or does it do it kill anyone that opens to eat, whether it's healthy or not? Okay. It's just like if you have your mouth open and I'm passing around poison and you're the healthiest person here, guess what's going to happen to you? <laughs> Watch out, Frank. <laughs> I'll ask about it. I'm sorry, were you, were you done with the minerals? Um, is there anything more you want to know about minerals? Uh, how about it? I love the minerals and meat that we utilize. There's minerals in everything. In fact, one of the highest concentrations of calcium and uh, magnesium is in meats. It's most assimilable. Um, juice is okay in that area, but not as concentrated with the meat because for some reason magnesium and calcium is better utilized in a concentration of fat that is animal based and um, um, protein. So almost all of the minerals in meat, as long as the meat's not dehydrated or not cooked, 100% of the minerals can be utilized in cell tissue. And when you're eating raw foods, like raw meats, you need very little calcium. Once you heat um, a food, you cauterize the minerals. That's like take, taking clay, which is normally malleable. Once you fire it, it is pottery. You cannot grow mold in it or plants in it anymore. It is dead. And that's the same thing that happens when you cook food. You cauterize the minerals. The calcium rate of absorption is like down to 12%, 10 to 12% can be somewhat properly utilized. That means a loss of 88% of the calcium from cooking in meat, cooking the meat. So all this calcium loss is not because the soils are deficient, it's because we're damaging the nutrients before we put them into our body and we can't utilize them. What are grains doing to you? I mean, some healthy cultures eat grains, like brown rice. If we do that now, is it different than when they did that? In their cultures? Well, we have so much more process. The, her question was, there are cultures that seem to be able to thrive by eating grains. Or a combination. Um, pardon? Or a combination. I mean, they could have it in their diet. Right. It would seem like we can. Um, the cultures who eat strictly grains are the unhealthiest cultures in the world. There's third world countries, you can see the children with the distended stomachs and their bones with distended stomachs. Those are cultures that only eat grain. 
to bring malnourished culture. Those who mix, like the Japanese and Chinese, uh, and eat lots of grains, still um, is not a healthy thing because the human body can only handle about seven to eight percent concentration of byproduct of advanced glycation end product. Anytime the body uses glycogen as fuel, there's a byproduct called a glycotoxin called advanced glycation end product. And Columbia University in New York City did the research on it for about 28 years, 28 to 30 years, and found that in a healthy body, it stores at a rate of 70% every time you eat a carb. That means it stays in your body for your lifetime. 70% of that toxicity. If you're unhealthy, like somebody with a compromised kidney or diabetes, it stores at a rate of 90% or more. That, that is a sugar product that actually melts tissue when it becomes so concentrated, like Coca-Cola. So that's why flesh and muscles start sagging, because it fills up and starts melting the tissues. That cannot be removed. We are humans that just live that way. Um, from my understanding of research of, um, of history of the Asian cultures, the royalty, the dynasties, only ate meats and fat. They kept the lackeys half eating half or more carbohydrates like grains to keep them emotionally in balance. Because high carbohydrate keeps uh, has a sugar problem in the body and you can't keep up with that much advanced glycation end product. So what they found was that emotionally they were unstable and could never overthrow the hierarchy. Also more passive. And the Egyptians did it also. Yeah, I was going to say also more passive at the same time. It's no, actually it makes them more irritable and violent. So rice, do you don't think, creates okay. passivity? No. No? Okay. No. So in your book, you mentioned eating butter and sure didn't make me pass it. I was a macrobiotic. <laughs> when I was a macrobiotic, I was ready to kill. Were you? Yes. <laughs> when you mentioned eating bread and butter in your book, uh -huh. or potatoes, was that before you kind of looked into the carbo, or is it okay to have some starch? Well, you know, when I read that research, and then I started doing some experiments with it, it was always, you know, a trade-off mm -hmm. with the cooked starch. You know it's poisonous, there are byproducts in it, we're not going to handle it properly, we'll have to use tremendous amounts of nutrients to discard all of the wastes and toxins that are involved in it. But I couldn't find any other starch that chelated with neurological toxins. Anytime you have trauma or an upset in your life, there's a hormone, there are hormones that are produced in the neurological system that are just like any other poison in the system. They will store and have to be detoxified. If you want to know the particulars about that, you can uh, go on the internet and look for The Biology of Emotions by Elnora Van Winkle. She was a biochemist that worked on neurological compounds for about 40 some years at New York City uh, Medical University. What was her name again? Elnora Van Winkle, Biology of Emotions. She has the complex medical paper and then a layman's paper for the average person to understand it. So you can read both or either. And she explains that when she was doing the tests and researching, she found neurological hormones that uh, related to trauma. And she, they categorized them and, uh, and differentiated them. And she found that people, when they go through an emotional upset that has no relationship to reality, that she's found that they're detoxing these hormones. She was a person who believed in primal therapy, which means you scream, you rant, you rave, you kick pillows, you beat things to death, except for humans. But when I used to exercise primal therapy, um, it only continued the rage. So I, I decided to do the opposite. Whenever I felt rage, I would go paint, you know, paint or smell flowers or do gardening, sing, do everything that was pretty and nice rather than violent. 
and I found that I was able to change myself that way. So she and I had quite a disagreement, but she was still in her anger. You know? <laughs> she did my diet for about two years and then thought that the Instincto was better. And instinctive means you eat what's attracted to you. And she was 70 years old at the time. So she wanted to please her palate. So she consumed a tremendous amount of fruit, lost another 25 pounds, so she was skin and bones. And she lasted that way for a year and a half, and she died last year. She just got too thin. Can't do that. You know, it's like a Pangaea in another community in Hawaii on the big island. They were instinctos, of course. They tell you to smell fruit first, and if that appeals to you, eat it. So these people were eating, you know, 35% to 85% of their diet was fruit. So they were always having staph infections that would ooze like they, they, had, they had the psoriasis. And uh, they were always ill-tempered, unhappy, unsatisfied, never calm, always fidgeting. I mean, it just and work toward a social environment, a happy, self-sustainable cultural environment. But he couldn't take it because everybody was haywire, including him. So they went on my diet, so he came back and found the place, an entirely a different place, so he bought it back. Now he's living there. So that's the difference between high fruit you know, and high meat fat diet. It makes a huge difference. So, getting back to the whole starch thing, I wanted to get away from anything that pollutes the body, so I worked very hard at finding something I could use to substitute for that cooked starch with the raw fat to bind with those neurological toxins. Nuts was my best shot, but I couldn't get rid of the enzyme inhibitors that would prevent digestion of protein for 24 to 48 hours after eating the nuts. And that's not just the protein in the nuts, that's the protein in any food you eat after that, whether it be um, um, eggs or, or meat. Just wouldn't digest properly. So I started thinking about what could I neutralize these enzyme inhibitors with? What could I inhibit the enzyme inhibitors? Turn it right back on them. Yeah. So I found that when I mixed, I mixed quite a few things to try to work it out. And finally, when I mixed eggs, honey, and a fat with it, whether it was butter, coconut cream, peanut oil, uh, olive oil, some compound with it, some fat with it, it worked. And it only had to take it one day a week and it would work for the whole week. Wow. So the lube formula is... So I, got, so I used the nut formula. Okay. The nut formula, uh, you know, in combination with the nut formula is nuts, egg, a fat, and honey. And it has to be a lot of honey. Per, you know, let's say, I recommend normally a half a cup of nuts. The softer nuts are better, like um, walnuts and pecans, pine nuts. Still works for some people who have a good liver, and, and pumpkin seeds for those few who have a good liver, and sun, um, sunflower seeds. So the preferable are, the easiest to digest are walnuts and pecans, the next are pine nuts and sunflower seeds. However, the pine nuts can cause intense glandular detoxification and nausea. So if you have that, you don't want the pine nuts. Yes? No, no almonds? No, almonds are very difficult to digest. Do you have to soak them? If you soak them, you've created, you've turned them into a, um, a vegetable. And what if you sprout them? Cellulose, same thing, they're a vegetable. Once it's a sprout, it's a vegetable. Find a juice, but then you still have some enzyme inhibitors in sprouts. You know what? If you uh, if you soak them in, let's say, uh, um, uh, in whey, when you make your cheese. Um, <coughs> I've not experimented with that. It's a possibility. I don't know that the whey will, you know, incapacitate the the. Um, 
lactic acid will incapacitate the enzyme inhibitor, uh, those enzyme inhibitors, the protein inhibitors, because they're pretty strong. Um, all I would have to do a test and see. Okay. Um, because aren't there a lot of the, um, uh, the enzyme inhibitors in the, in the, in the walnut? And some well, like I say, they're in there, but I found that if I make that combination of the eggs, fat, and the honey with it, with it. it neutralizes it. Does it make a difference if you soak the almonds in pineapple juice? Is that useful? That'll cause most people gas. Okay. You're talking about high sugar food. Even though it has you know, lots of acids in it, like the bromelain, and it will help break down the nuts to some extent. The high sugar and reaction with that particular kind of fat and high carbohydrate will cause indigestion yeah. and gas in a lot of people. I can see that. Most people. I've never met anybody who could do it without farting all day long. <laughs> I would like to make a testimonial. I'm not farting since I'm on your diet. I just want everybody to know that. <laughs> most people fart don't. Free. Most, most <laughs> gas goes Fart free, yes. That's, 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 that's. So what are the nuts doing again? What are the nuts doing again? I'm sorry. I wasn't quite sure. What all the, the nuts things. bind with uh, neurological toxins, including hormones that have stored in the body from trauma. That's pretty cool. And everybody detoxes trauma hormones, and you might go into that, oh, I hate this guy because you had an incident with a guy before, your father beat the shit out of you one time, and that neurological compound comes up. All of a sudden, you're looking at some other man in your life, and you're saying, I hate you, you bastard. And it's got nothing to do with him. You know? <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> So nuts, like there's something there. Nuts yes. and you know, like crazy nuts. And <laughs> crazy nuts, yes. <laughs> the nuts. Those cruciferous vegetables that are so healthy for you. That's a problem. The cruciferous vegetables that are so healthy for you is a problem. And that's the problem. Flatulence. I thought, you know, well, how can you go to work or anywhere? You know, if you are eating a lot of this, or um, well, we're not we're not made to digest you're vegetables. You're not right. So um, when you're eating those things, they will cause gas. What do you eat? Be sure to eat with it to counter the effect. No, you have vegetable way. juice. Vegetable juice is what you have, so you're not having whole vegetables. If you have, let's say you have a salad, you could eat some um, some avocado with it. That would reduce the gas. Okay. So basically, because either whether it's cooked or not, it's, it's the cauliflower, the broccoli, the... Um, They'll cause the gas onions. with or without yeah. being cooked. Yeah. Because they're, so they're because really it's, not it's not, we're not meant to digest them. The healthiest vegetables are the... Worst, you know, yeah, right. Vegetables. But they're all. But you can have them as juice. The you have them as juice. You don't need the fiber. If you're on an right. all raw diet, meat diet, meat gives you enough fiber. You don't need any fiber. Fiber is there for people who eat cooked foods because the foods have no vitamins and enzymes to properly digest. Peristalsis is reduced by two thirds, so the food doesn't move. It putrefies, especially meats when they're cooked. So what happens is you eat vegetables with it to help get some vitamins and enzymes and broom it through. But on a raw diet, whole vegetables will constipate you. They'll create the opposite effect. Because what happens is an herbivore has a digestive tract two and a half times longer than ours. They have 60,000 times more enzymes to disassemble the cellulose molecule to obtain fats and proteins. They have two to four stomachs, we have one. So what happens is, we digest only a third of the, the, the vegetables, and that's mainly juice for the vitamins and enzymes and minerals. So what happens is, by the time it gets down to the colon, it's still producing the alkalinity. The bowel has to be entirely acid, or the E. coli won't feed on the fecal matter. And then we get constipated. Because on a diet like this, like all herbivores, I mean like all carnivores, they don't eat fiber, yet they move all the time. Unless they eat vegetables. You feed them vegetables, it prevents the bacteria from feeding on the fecal matter and sponging it out. A normal bowel movement for a human being should be 60 to 80% bacteria. 
mainly E. coli that swells it up and, and, and uh, sponges it. The byproducts of that are B vitamins and amino acids and the veritoxin which shrinks tumors in two to seven days. The uh, University of Toronto has been using the veritoxin produced by E. coli to completely dissolve human brain tumors in two to seven days, including the vessels going to the, the tumor. Hello, and they're telling us not to eat, you know, not to worry about E. coli. I beg your pardon. That's a, that's a cancer preventative. All animals eat fecal matter except humans. I mean, civilized humans. Before this diet, do we really need to? <laughs> well, I do recommend it for people who have terminal cancer. Uh-huh. Cool. And I've seen it turn it around. I've seen somebody. I've seen so many people go downhill. And now, if I can talk them into eating some fecal matter, mm-hmm. it'll turn it around. It turns it around like crazy. So is that all that lactobacillus stuff? Not kind of like. That lactobacillus stuff is another marketing tool. It has nothing to do with the human body. So we don't even really have that in there? Or we do, and it's just a small percentage? Well, there's of lactobacillus, acidophilus, carcosum, bulgaricus, and bulgarius in raw milk. That's what raw milk is for, is to get the bacterial environment going in an animal. That's what milk is for. Mm. I use milk because I found that it relaxes a toxic system that is so toxic as the human for me eating so much cooked food and all the pollution. When I try to not use dairy, people have much more difficulty with relaxation, um, ease of diet. It's difficult to get rid of their cravings. It's much more difficult. Milk, raw milk, is just like a drug. Mm-hmm. It's very helpful. The Indians use, the one thing that gave me the clues, because when I lived with the American Indians for a while, the, the Yaqui Indians um, in Mexico, they used, if, if someone got a, let's say a scorpion bite, or a tarantula bite, or a snake bite, it was poisonous. If they had a lactating animal, and they raised goats, they had goat's milk. If they had a lactating animal, they would drink the milk rather than cut and suck. Because the milk would draw the poison to the stomach and then they'd vomit. Right it worked so easily. It was miraculous. How much would you drink? They drank about a cup. Oh, really? That little? Mm. Yeah. Is that different than the cream now? If you, do, you have, do you need to have both the milk and the cream? Yeah, the, that, the, cream, the cream will work doing, to, do, to draw the poison to the stomach. It has to do with the, um, the combination of the... Uh, lactic acids and the sugars and the proteins and the fats all together. What do you do to settle your stomach after your vomit? Um, usually on this diet, there's nothing you have to do. You know, have a sip of cream if you want. A little cheese to absorb anything that's left in the stomach. A little cheese and butter. I mean, a little cheese and cream. The cream will coat and soothe and the cheese will absorb any excess bile and any other toxin that's in the stomach. And people who are nauseous all the time, it's a good idea to eat just a little sugar cube sized an ounce of cheese, the no, no solid raw cheese, you know, every 20 minutes to 40 minutes to an hour, mm. all day long. I prefer that people don't mix it with vegetable juice because, like I said, it may prevent the proper utilization of the vegetable juice and the cheese. But when you're in a situation like that, it's better to lose some nutrients from the juice and have the the cheese absorb the toxins. What's the maximum amount of vegetable juice to have in a day and at a time? Well, that's an individual thing. Um, sometimes I can go with, you know, six cups a day, but it can cause a protein deficiency if I have that too often. So I have to stay right at about four cups a day, and that's for most people. For you, you're a much larger person. You could do five to six a day. Five to six eight-ounce cups. And you might want to have 12 ounces at a time instead of eight ounces. There's more of you than I. I'd like to ask about the young man that I spoke with you about earlier, uh, 
who's about 13, 14 years old and with the open heart surgeries as an infant. And um, he's had some good results, you know, in, in the work that we've done together. He's focusing more, he's sleeping really well, and he's also not shaking quite as much. But there's obvious to me that there's a long road to go. Mm -hmm. So they've taken their first steps with the diet and uh, you know, he does drink Cokes, he does eat, he attract to sugar, but he's been drinking the pie, you know, the far infrared magnetic water, so he's not having as much sugar now. He's not as attracted to it. So I began him with just the smoothie, um, in the, and he now is using the, the raw eggs and the raw butter and the cream, and, you know, with the blueberries and so forth and the honey. And they love sushi, so he's kind of used to having raw fish, you know, a full way to... Um, he's very who pale. Was asked, the question was asked was, is a child who had open heart surgery what age? Uh, infant, like like a few days after he was born. A few days after the, it was born, he had open heart surgery. The child is pretty much crippled? Paraplegic? Not at all. No. He, no. He's 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 he goes to school. He plays sports, but when he sits there, he's like always moving and uh -huh. difficulty focusing. I mean, mm -hmm. now after two months with the foreign thread and magnetic, he, his teachers are calling up the parents and saying he's focusing. He's mm -hmm. he's doing his math and what 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 are you doing? But I just saw him the other day and, and they're saying he's greatly improved. But I'm still seeing him out there and he right. can't take sunlight. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't. That's not necessarily mercury poisoning. I misunderstood. I thought he was okay. somewhat crippled. I thought it was by... anesthesia, you know, from the surgeries. Possibly. Well, that kind of it's very basic. If he's just going like this, it means he's too thin. He doesn't have enough fat. He is very so, thin. So what happens is that every time he has sugar, the sugar goes into the myelin, makes lesions in the myelin to pull the fat out of it. So. You know, this is what happens. You know, when you have that kind of a thing. Right. That that's the guy. Right yeah. There. So if you have, <laughs> you know the guy. <laughs> lots of that. If, yeah, I was one of them. Right. If you have lots of that. Pressed cheese, like you're saying, he's making more fresh cheese than the more cultured and aged pressed cheese. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's more enzyme activity in it, um, but the most of the minerals will not be able to be utilized intercellularly. Okay, that's what They'll still be good for detoxification, but there will be more enzymes and activity in it. Okay, great. Um, the the combination that I've uh, been uh, eating is with the meat, and not just eating uh, the meat, but then at the end eating meat and uh, with some butter. At the uh, end butter. of what? What's, at the end of what? Oh, let's say if I, I if I have a portion of meat, mm -hmm. the end portion of that meat, I have it with uh, a butter and beef palm. You mean you've eaten most of it, and then yeah, you're having yeah. a, you have a few bites left, and you want to eat it with bee pollen? Yeah, and, and, and the butter. I find that it's just you know, for me. It just helps. Is there any feedback on that? Or? It's good. It's fine. Okay. If you want to increase cellular regeneration, it's best to have some um, uh, royal jelly with it. About a huh? pea-sized amount of royal jelly, because that's a precursor for the human growth hormone if you have it with meat. Okay. Bee pollen just adds more protein and you're already concentrated in protein, mm -hmm. so it's not really necessary, whereas the royal jelly would add something to your meat. Okay, because I was thinking the bee pollen makes it because we had so many enzymes and coenzymes. In. If you're having it with cheese, yeah, it will help. Oh, well. Yeah, it will help the digestion and utilization of the cheese. Oh, okay, because that's why I was mixing it with the butter. I figured that the enzymes and, and the fat of the butter. Are well, I, I can't say that there's a great deal of enzymes in the uh, in the um, pollen. Oh, really? It's high in protein. It's yeah. one of the most concentrated foods in um, fractionated protein and, and B vitamins, but it's not that high in enzymes. Well, that, that's interesting because uh, from my just just my readings, uh -huh. I, I, I was told that um, uh, it has a 5,000 enzymes and coenzymes. That's when you digest it and utilize it, if you digest and utilize it, uh -huh. but it has to go through that process first. Okay. Of dividing it, I mean, fractionating it, re reutilizing it. Those, uh, those proteins in the bee pollen will be reassimilated into enzymes yeah. for doing all sorts of things in the human body. I understand. Because they're such concentrated in particles of protein. Right. Yes. Bee pollen, how much is too much? 
Um, I don't think I've ever had enough to try, nor I knew anybody else that had enough. I think it's so expensive and so rare that people don't <laughs> need it, you know, that much to be saturated with it. I remember one time I had probably a half a cup a day for about a month, and I just got tired of it, but uh, I didn't get sick from it. Mm -hmm. So I can't say that there is a saturation point. Do you use royal jelly? Of about 14 to 15 day old um, uh, high fish. Did you chew it? Oh, yes, I chewed every morsel of it. Is it better to chew than so, to swallow? Yes, because you'll absorb it right into the brain and everywhere. <laughs> but uh, it did cause a spinal and it caused a meningitis and a spinal meningitis. So I was crippled for a, you know about a week and in a lot of pain for a while. But it did. But according to iridology, I still had 70% of my brain was scar tissue. After that forced uh, inoculation, I mean forced um, uh, um, inundation of uh, of that fish bacteria, causing the meningitis, I got rid of 25% of the scar tissue within three months yeah. from the brain. So I'm not as dumb as I used to be. <laughs> wow. So. Normally, how? I mean, you have it every every. It depends what you do. Like Are you taking it to be happy? Oh, and let everybody know. The Eskimos eat high meat once a year, and they eat a tremendous amount of it. And the kids will jump up and down and wave and cheer and just go bananas for this stinky, awful, rotten smelling <laughs> stuff. And it smelled so bad I couldn't get within five feet of it without gagging. So I had to keep it as for, well, I can ask you later about personally because it's about dentistry. And, um, uh -huh. um, um, we've talked to an uh, uh, Indian in Mexico, Shaman, and he says that herbs are, it's important that they not eat the fresh herbs, that you have certain drying times for each kind of herb and that brings out a particular medicinal sometimes esoteric capacity of it. So I wonder what is the problem with doing um, dried herbs? Is it just that it's it, does it actually detract anyway or is it just that it... Um, yes, it detracts. It's, what happens is whenever you have something dried like that it takes about a million times more enzymes to rehydrate that, to go through the system, to get it to open up, to get those nutrients. Mm -hmm. Also, when you, you dehydrate it like that, any heavy metals in it are now toxic. They're free radicals. They're no longer bioorganically utilized. They're no longer ionically active. So any mercury lead that's in it becomes a poison. And that's what they use it for. It's a small dosage of poison, even the arsenic in it, is now poisonous. So it works only by poisoning your system. So your body stops its normal detoxification, which means it ends symptoms to deal with the poison in the blood and then the intestinal tract. So it's just like the American medical profession and their drugs. It poisons the system and temporarily stops symptoms, but does not aid or reverse or cure or heal the condition. So you still have the condition, you've just postponed it and made it worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to understand, when you've got a culture that is starving and don't have the nutrients they use like the, like the Chinese. Mm -hmm. The lackeys were forced to live mainly on grain, mainly rice. Your doctors have to work within that framework if the government tells them that that's their diet. They have to find some kind of method to keep them working and active and not in detox all the time. So they die earlier. That's the loss of a lackey, you know, he's just a machine. Basically, that's the way they looked at it. So they used herbs and they would try to figure out anything they could because if they couldn't do it, they didn't have a job. And they were out in the fields with the other lackeys. So they had to become ingenious and work within that framework. So the yes. poison books are just one little... And the acid, and when you eat an herb that's dried like that, it only turns acid. There's no alkalinity anymore. Mm -hmm. That turns acid because those minerals are now free radical. So they become more dominant 
instead of the alkalinizing minerals being dominant like in fresh, especially in juice, it becomes just the opposite. The free radicals are dominant and start grabbing onto everything. So the acid are more prevalent. We do a little experimentation on, on the fresh, different fresh herbs to see if we can um, get some of the same effect. I, mean, I just heard that some of the good things happening with these. Well, I, you know, in, in the early 70s, I did two years of experiment with fresh and cooked. Yeah. Always the results were bad from cooked. But the results were good with fresh. But I did not document it. And it was just my own experience and a couple of other people. And it was good. Like I said in my book, you know, on the leaf, something I still have to do, something I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. But I can't say that it will, the same thing that's in your herb book is going to be the way it will react, you know, in a raw state. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this lady has not asked a question. <laughs> She's all ears. <laughs> Question, which I've been trying to get in about five times now. Um, you mean I'm ignoring you, Brenda? Yes. <laughs> oh, That's because you pinched me because I didn't wear the green. <laughs> okay, uh, from Ben to someone in the group, um, what would you recommend if they have been diagnosed with thyroid cancer? Let's say that again. Diagnosed with what? Thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer? Well, it depends upon what's causing it. I mean, they may have mercury in there. They could have a dozen different compounds in there. So it would be based on that, getting rid of that and reversing the, the accumulation of dead cells, which is a tumor. See, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Could be, you know, iodine supplements, which is, is a mineral poisoning. Because um, that can dissolve, uh, you know, tissue in an area where it stores. Iron supplements can do it. They can rust in the body. The whole iron supplement thing is such a joke. I mean, you're taking metals where you're taking. You're not taking a, a food substance that could be absorbed properly. You're taking a metal into your body that's going to rust in contact with with moisture. And I see it in people's systems all the time. Especially in people who have been diagnosed with uh, anemia, they'll find pockets of rust in their system, and that's where they're breaking down. Right. So it's the object is to find out what metal it is, try to get rid of it, uh, if it is a metal, or if it's just not being the liver not working, and that's a particular area that is weak in that person. There has to be some toxicity in that area for it if it's degenerative in any way. Mm -hmm. If it's just a cancer because the liver isn't working and the body's not able to dissolve dead cells and it's collecting dead cells everywhere in the body, I have found in 90 some percent of the cases that the body will develop a tumor in a strong area. Mm -hmm. So the body can dissolve it and get rid of it pretty easily later. So it doesn't create a tremendous malfunction. Mm -hmm. So that person's thyroid could be healthy thyroid. Mm -hmm. And then it'd be forming there. Mm -hmm. So then it's a whole different approach to removing it. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to get rid of it, do things that get, you know, it's all, always the liver is involved. And the liver is not making the fats to dissolve dead cells. So you collect dead cells, and whether it's a benign tumor or it's a malignant tumor, it doesn't make any difference except that it's preferable to have a malignant tumor because you can dissolve it in days. If it's a benign tumor, it could take 20 years to dissolve. Mm -hmm. The cancer cell has an acid fluid in it, so when it dies, it sets out that serum. It's a solvent, and it dissolves all the surrounding dead cells so then your body can break it down and discard it easily. But when your body has to go into a benign tumor, it has to make the solvent to dissolve the compound, neutralize it, and send it out of the body. It's a long, slow process unless you're on a good diet for a long time. So benign tumors are opposite of the medical profession. Benign tumors are less desirable than malignant. So they just need fats to Well, if the liver is working. So you have to get the liver working. You know, then fats are important. 
to dissolve the dead cells and get rid of it. And of course, you could always eat bagel matter. I'll give you an example. Lori, a girl who's on the diet, came to me. She'd been chronically fatigued for eight years. She had cancer of the right breast, uh, hip bone, and the femur joint and the hip bone, um, and the uh, right kidney, and it was attached to the adrenal gland. She didn't have any medical therapy. Um, she just went on the diet. And after two years, she broke the chronic fatigue, but there was no shrinkage of the appearance of the toxins that were in the areas where she had tumors. There was, you know, the right breast, which was one third larger than the left, was full of lumps like rocks. And I mean, it was just like a whole bag of rocks. And in that two year period, almost all of them had dissolved to where it just felt. Um, there were maybe four or five of them only instead of 30 to 40 small lumps that were like, you know, like hardened callous tissue rather than rocks. So there was a shrinkage of that. But in the iris, there was no indications of the removal of the toxic conditions for those three areas. So I ran into the work by... Um, um, Dr. Arab at the University of Toronto that used E. coli, the veritoxin from E. coli, to shrink the brain tumors in two to five days. So I suggested that she try some fecal matter. And I told her she could just eat the fecal matter, an ounce or two ounces at a time, or put it on meat and let it incubate in there, let the E. coli eat on the meat and then eat that. Everything the medical profession and scientific community tell you not to do. Okay, so she ate, she did it both ways. She ate about two ounces of fecal matter and then grew some. And within three months, the all of the tumors in every area had shrunk by about a third. And then she went to Hawaii a year ago. Um, a year ago, I guess it was about this time. And they slaughtered a goat or a sheep and she ate about... Uh, a cup of the fecal matter from the near the end of the the sheep's uh, bowel, and uh, when she returned, and I checked her irises about four months later, it had dissolved another third in all those areas, and it always followed, you know, within months of doing the fecal matter. When she would go five, eight, nine months without any change in it. What accounts for the delay, like the few months? Before? It takes time. You know, bacteria just doesn't go in and okay, so you know disappear. Like away. if you were injected right into the area, like you know Dr. Arab did, then you've got it right in the area. But when you eat it, it it has to find its way. Okay, so does, know, does that system. interest you then is going more immediately direct on to the negative? No, no. Because that scares me, because you may be injecting something in there right. that could cause a side effect. Okay. You know, let the body do it slowly. It's much brighter than you are. That's the, my thing, son. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's much brighter than we are. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, just, it just tastes like the, the, you know, she's eaten and I've eaten it with her. Um, you know, gopher, fecal matter, sheep fecal matter, goat fecal matter, buffalo fecal matter. She's eaten my fecal matter, I've not eaten mine. And um, it always tastes like basically, if it's from an herbivore, it tastes like the grass. It just tastes like grass or whatever they're eating. It tastes like the herb. Mine, I eat meat and all that stuff and berries, so I don't know what mine tastes like. You have to ask Lori about that. <laughs> So you, you go hunt around the buffalo and wait for them to, to pass. Patty? Yeah, yeah, to patty out. Mm -hmm. and, and then just you be it. fresh. You want that bacteria fresh. <laughs> Question? Yes. This will be the last. Um, I have a, a, a room that has a lot of um, mold and stuff on the beach. So I use an ionizer, and I heard in some of your tapes you don't like ionizers. And this is a broad spectrum ionizer. So well, it doesn't make any difference. If you take a look at the molecule, when they start, you know, when you start putting ions in the air, there are chain reactions. And if you've got a heavy toxin in the air, 
and it becomes bound by a, an ion that's shooting and it gets into your lungs mm. or your tissue, what's going to happen? It's going to fuse into your tissue. I, I don't mind them as long as you turn them on while you're not in the house. And when you get in that, or have it on the timer, mm -hmm. and then don't go into that house until it's been off for 20 minutes, because that chain reaction continues for about 20 minutes. All right. So I can't use it. Just can't use it. Just don't be in the house when it's going. Perfect. Well, what good is it? Pardon? Isn't it good? Oh yeah, it gets rid of toxic substances that are floating in your environment, okay. and it'll go into your curtains and your walls everywhere and everything. And it'll embed there, but you don't want it to embed in your lungs and body. So it works on everything. Right. It works on mold. It works on everything. Yeah. It'll break everything down. It's like a you know, it's like a chain reaction of atomic bomb. Yeah. So the same thing with ozonated too. Because yeah. that's pretty radical. Then just yeah. shut it off and let the room stabilize. Perfect. Yep. That's good. And if you have a moisturizer going, it'll settle quicker. Oh, so some moisture in the air. air. Yeah. Because as long as it's dry, that, that can go on for two hours after you shut it down. Yeah, because I'm living in a dry area right now. Yeah. So it's... Get a humidifier if you're going to do that. Okay. And, you know, turn the ionizer off, um, you know, for 20 minutes before you go into the house, but leave the humidifier on during that 20 minutes. Okay. I can do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, folks, that's it. We've shot for two hours. Hi, Sarah. Okay, yeah. Where you been? Oh, I you came in late? I did see. Well, she Okay, you done it? Have you? You're on? No. Come over here in the sunlight. Oh. Okay, Okay, your right testy is starting to debilitate, but it's still functional. The uh, left one's a little bit better, it's starting to debilitate a little bit. Somebody go you write this down for him when I start getting the suggestions and also all this stuff. I'm not a good writer, but I don't really want to do it. Let's let me assist. Is it anemia? Like your red blood cells are not healthy red blood cells. Mm -hmm. I would suggest about 70% red meat for about a year and a half, mm -hmm. 18 months. Mm -hmm. And then you could cut it down to about 50-50. Okay. Um, juice, I would recommend um, about 50% celery, 40% uh, summer squash to get rid of this metal poisoning, and 10% uh, um, carrot just to soothe the tissue. Um, normally, I give lots of um, uh, alpha, I mean um, parsley mm -hmm. to utilize the oxygen properly, and you need that. But I think that the only reason you're not utilizing the oxygen is because of the metal poisoning, mm -hmm. not because you don't assimilate oxygen. Mm -hmm. It's just that the metals, the free radicals, are always uh, usurping the oxygen. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm not giving you a lot. Okay. If in you know next time I come in two months, if you're here, if I come in two months, uh, the next time I see you, if I see that it hasn't changed, then you know I would suggest that you eat some parsley. Okay. So you said 50 celery, 40 celery squash, 10 carrots. Correct. How, how many times? A day. Probably have four cups a day. Okay. And uh, the meat, um, do I eat yeah. fish with it at, at, at all? Or just it's always better to eat some fish with the beef if you're eating Good. the red meat. Mm -hmm. Just so you don't become overly acidic. Um, fruit for you would be um, pineapple with an equal amount of either coconut cream, raw cream, or butter. Mm -hmm. Um, you need lots of honey. You're enzyme deficient. Um, 
you have symptoms similar to lots of vegetarians. Um, <laughs> so you're lacking a lot of protein enzymes. Mm-hmm. So honey, you need a lot of honey. Okay, good, because um, just uh, in the past month, or so, I've been going raw. Mm-hmm. And so I would have hate to have seen what you would have said a month ago. <laughs> um, but uh, you write about the, um, uh, the, the metals. I, I've known about that. You write about mm-hmm. the, the, the right uh, uh, kidney. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you, you, I didn't know about the uh, I, uh, suspicions about the thyroid, but mm-hmm. not uh, so much about uh, being um, uh, diabetic. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Get away from food. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you eat a little bit, you know, like I, because I have you know, diabetes, I only eat two once every two three days. Mm-hmm. You, know, you need a little bit, you don't need much. Okay, so um, I was having like a half an apple with my avocado, so I okay thing. Mm, probably not the best. Mm-hmm. Um, so apple isn't a good thing. Is well, avocado it's, it's, avocado's fine because it's mainly fat and protein. Mm-hmm. Very little, you know, mm-hmm. there's practically no sugar in it. Okay. No, no carbs in it. Um, but I'm talking about sweet or, you know, sub-acid fruits mm-hmm. that are too high in sugar. Apple's very high in sugar. Mm-hmm. And it also is a sugar that penetrates the system mm-hmm. and gets in and overexcites the adrenal glands. That's one of the reasons in the Bible that it would be because it would cause irritability because it was so radically sugar uh, would raise the blood sugar level and make people irritable and that created a bad social environment. Okay. And I, I, think, I believe I was being told towards um, heart or, or liver. Mm-hmm. Is well, that's because that your liver is so metal poisoned. I would okay. eat a lot of liver. Okay. And uh, you still need muscle meat if you want to, you know, develop muscle. Okay. I was doing top uh, for top round. Top round, bottom round, sirloin, any of those are good. And what about heart? Heart's good. Okay. Uh, it's a great muscle. Okay. And then um, uh, something about um, uh, the intestine after the first stomach. It was, uh, like it was two, I think there's, I think there's two stomachs in a, say, uh, in, a, in a cow. Two to four. Okay. Yeah. And so it's, it would be the, the part of the, the intestine for some reason after the first stomach. Must be a biological twin. Uh-huh. I got a question. Like two thumbs. Okay. Um, okay, your ovaries are very overactive. The, the right one is debilitating about 50%, so that's starting to disseminate. Um, your pancreas is edemic on both sides. Uh, it's almost completely debilitated on the left. On the right, it's debilitating. It's about uh, probably 20, 25% active. I wouldn't have more than one piece of food a day. Of course, always with some fats. Um, lots of bile throughout your entire system. It looks like your body didn't get enough fat, so it gets bile in place of fat to bind with poison. Mm-hmm. It's a very caustic substance that will make you very dry and irritable and you know, tense. And mm-hmm. it's, you've got it everywhere. So you're going to yellow. You're going to get orange sometimes and dis- discharge. Yeah, in fact, you might even discolor, get brown spots. Mm-hmm. Orange spots that turn brown for a while. Mm-hmm. So it looks like you, you maybe had a sunburn and only in one spot or one area. And it'll go away. I've just seen that now in my hands and seen another There's even more in your face right. yeah, mm-hmm. than there is in your hand. Mm-hmm. If you can see how it's yeah. discharging. Um, basically, your tissues are in pretty good shape. They're just poisoned by all this bile. Mm-hmm. Um, you should have pretty good recuperative abilities. Your intestines are in terrible shape. Uh, looks like even some gangrenous tissue on the left side. Um, the thyroid's in good shape on the right side. Parathyroid doesn't look like it's functioning. Um, it's a little bit of mound around the um, around the tonsils. On one side it's flat, and the other side it isn't. Um, it looks like this side was removed. Probably both removed, and maybe the uh, uh, the uh, lymph glands are supporting it. Did you have your tonsils with you? No, I didn't have it. It must be really deteriorating to hear a pathogen say, ah. Uh-huh. 
Before I started this, I was vegetarian for five years. So, yeah. so they probably just ate, ate away. Yeah. yeah. The left thy uh, thyroid is okay. Mm -hmm. Not working very much. Parathyroid is okay. Uh, poor circulation in the uh, left side of the spine, just below the shoulder blade down to the waist. Circulation in the uh, gonads are uh, is limited. Um, I would suggest about uh, 60 to 70 percent red meat and 30 to 40 percent um, white meat. About um, half and half fowl and, and seafood. Juice. Oh, the salts. Um, I suggest 80% celery, 20% parsley. Don't complicate it. For some reason, your person has very little metal poisoning in the body. You have it around your ears um, and in your eardrums. Um, Usually it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It probably would contaminate your gonads, your ovaries, and in, in your intestines. Did you take it orally? Uh, no. Or injection? I would feel a little bad right afterwards. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know. mm -hmm. Like well, you've recovered better than anybody else. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unless it's hidden, mm -hmm. buried deep in the bones, or, you know, hardly well, could be buried. Hopefully. It was just recently, and then mm -hmm. I, I was not feeling it. And then after that, it's when I started doing all food things. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I do have a diabetes, so I'm mm -hmm. the of the but the shot on this side is still about 20-25% active over here. Mm -hmm. So overall, if you take that 25 and cut it in half, that's the full function. Mm -hmm. So your pancreas is functioning about 12%, but you can still handle one piece of food a day mm -hmm. as long as you have it.